I mix, what I like, what I like, what I like, what I like, what I like. I mix what I like, what I like, what I like, what I like, what I like. Hey, 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 what's up, world? Welcome to another edition of I Mix What I Like Live. Again, I'm Jared Ball, happy to be your host. Uh, Please make sure, again, as always, that you are subscribed at imixwhatilike.org and following at imixwhatilike on all your relevant social media so you don't miss all the different things that that I and my colleagues are and will be doing, Uh, again, across multimedia and and the ever-expanding project, which I promise I, I, I keep thinking I'll be able to announce the next time I come on, um, uh, but um, we're very close. Uh, although I do know one one of those things that I can announce is the new show I'm going to be helping uh, put together for Dr. Sharice Bird and Steli called The Last Dope Intellectual. Um, so in fact, we'll be taping, uh, uh, is that today? I think we may be taping later today. So um, stay tuned for that. That's one thing I'm happy to announce. We can share that, uh, and much more coming. So, uh, including if you can come back at one o'clock, uh, this afternoon, 1 PM Eastern time, uh, where now that it has, it's streamed, uh, at Sundance and, uh, across, uh, parts of the internet, uh, I'm going to share some first thoughts on the new Fred Hampton film, uh, or should I say, the new William O'Neill film. <laughs> so if you don't mind a few spoilers, come on back at 1 p.m. Eastern, uh, and that will be just the first of what will be many discussions, including something else I know I can uh, uh, share, that on the 12th, when it makes its official uh, debut on HBO Max, Rosa Clemente and I are going to co-host uh, a watch party. Uh, so we can talk also with her, uh, again about her involvement as an associate producer with the film. Um, so, you know, so please do stick around, but, uh, all that said and taken care of, I want to uh, quickly get to our next guest who I'm very happy to, 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 re- I think this is the first time in all the years I've been broadcasting that I've actually interviewed, uh, our next guest, which is, uh, ridiculous on my part, given how, how often we've crossed paths over the years, uh, before she went fully off into the world, uh, sparking this this amazing film uh, c- career that uh, uh, I'm happy to talk with you all about. And of course, I'm talking about uh, Najma Nuruddin, who is an award-winning filmmaker with over 10 years of experience as a filmmaker and educator. Her work is centered on domestic ethnography, ethnography telling socially and culturally relevant stories that focus on humanity. And I'm happy to say she also is the uh the the director of a lover's call which is the first film featuring i should say as a background walking in the distant background my my two children so <laughs> i'm gonna say Najma, it's good to see you again welcome back hey uh, it's good to see you nice to see you too yeah it uh, was great having your daughters and my um my first film, my first narrative film that I did for um, my thesis film at Howard Film School. So that was a a lot of firsts. Yeah. And I like to say, I I, I mean, I keep saying feature, but of course we just walk by. Yeah, we're short. But for, but, but, you know, for, for, for me, it was a feature for sure. Most Um, definitely. And just, just as we get started here, because I want to start with, with, with uh, uh, this broad question about uh, what you describe as domestic ethnography. Mm. Uh, Even as I put up the the promotion for our discussion, a number of people were already asking, like, what is that? Right. Um, I'm sure I have to ask myself too. What am I talking about? (laughs) So what is that? And, and how does that feature in your work? And uh, as you talk a little bit about it, I'm going to show your website where people can go uh, and learn more just so we can get a little bit of view of some of that work, but go ahead, please share with us about that. Um, Cool. Yeah, no, um, domestic ethnography in the sense that uh, I'm really focused on telling work that at the moment that centers um, not only myself, but my family and my community, um, and then just the larger, um, uh, you know, world in general, but having this very um, humanistic foundation in the the stories that I tell. 
And so I think the reason why I was like, I wanted to use the, the wording domestic, domestic ethnography and ethnographic, I know sometimes it's like, maybe there's some like hesitation with that word, but I, I'm not um, saying eth ethnography in maybe the traditional kind of Eurocentric idea of ethnography and anthropology and that sort of thing. But um, it's really about um, me or us investigating and portraying and documenting and telling stories about our communities. And so one thing that I'm busy with right, right now is a documentary. At the moment, I'm calling it You're Muslim with a question mark. And so mm. that's, a, that's a documentary that I'm in pre-production in, or I guess I could say late kind of research and development slash pre-production phase uh, about, growing, about me growing up in Bakersfield, California as a Muslim person um, two of two of two parents who embrace Islam in their twenties changed their names. Um, they didn't join the Nation of Islam, but they became Orthodox under W. D. Muhammad, and you know had me, my my two siblings. Um, so we are like kind of on the front line, in, as into being um, like Muslims, you know, American Muslims or Black American Muslims and going through things that my parents didn't have to go through. And so it's really a documentary about navigating and reflecting on what that was like for me and my siblings, also tying in the history of um, the uh, Black Muslim experience or African-American Muslim, however you want to say it, you know. Um, yeah, that's fascinating right there. I didn't know that. I this I did yeah. not know. I, I, obviously, I don't know everything <laughs> about you, but I didn't know that about you at all. And and just so if anybody is not aware, although I don't. Yeah. Maybe maybe my students will see this because I think, you know, what I like to describe is the small and thoughtful audience that we have here would probably know. Mm. this, But but this is Elijah Muhammad's son. Yes, who breaks yes. off and be becomes an Orthodox Muslim away from the nation of Islam and has his own following uh, um, exactly, that is exactly. a, a, a perhaps less famous or less, I don't know, some uh, less pop culturally, I don't know. Yeah, discussed, maybe pop, but is, but is, maybe, you know. um, yeah, maybe pop culture. I mean, everyone knows that there's black American Muslims, but I think mm -hmm. the assumption because of how, um, impactful the nation was with Elijah Muhammad, with the, um, the early rise of Malcolm X that we all kind of associated, you know, if you're if you're an American and you're black, then you're like part of the nation of Islam. Mm -hmm. When there's like millions of other black people in the States who are Muslims that, that are not in the nation, but a lot, a lot of them do come out of that, um, that school, you know, that early training, because that definitely was the call um, you know, that got uh, our attention here, but there was, I don't know, maybe you could say an evolution or there was just some, you know, separation that happened. And so my, so my, my parent, my, my father was interested and was, was definitely attracted to that moment um, through the nation, but he became Muslim right when it was transitioning. And then he went, he just went into uh, the, the American Muslim Society, you know, with W.D. Muhammad. Um, but so all that story takes place in Bakersfield, California, which is a, in the middle of California, about an hour and a half from L.A., which is a very um, conservative white um, city, you know, white space where even if you, even if maybe the demographic numbers are shifting, um, it still have this, you know, mentality of this this white superiority complex um, or white supremacy that is there and entrenched in the space. And so, yeah, it's about just navigating um, what was that like growing up, and you know, to to constantly feel one. I'm the only black child in my class is growing up, and then I'm the black child with like a unique name who's not celebrating Christmas and Easter right. and. <laughs> And can't have pepperoni pizza, right, you know? right, right, right. So, 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 yeah, that's that's the the kind of the direction I'm going in with my my storytelling eth ethnography, but also, but but on on a, on a general scale, I'm very much into like historical stories, social, cultural, 
um, story. So like many filmmakers and many independent filmmakers, that's one of my many, many projects. Right, right. Well, yeah, right. <laughs> um, yeah, I, yeah. Because every time I, well, I, I, I know how it is just in my own work. And so every time I meet filmmakers, they're working on 20 different things. And yeah, um, yeah. so I, I feel you yeah. At least, uh, yeah, a little bit. Um, but I guess, yeah, I guess, you know, uh, uh, yeah, somewhat foolishly or ignorantly, I'm, I'm just thinking back. So that's, of course, why, uh, well, I'm thinking, of course, that, would, well, maybe not, but that would be one reason why Islam factored so heavily in A Lover's Call, just back at the beginning then, right? I didn't even, yeah. So that, yeah, well, that makes yeah. Sense. yeah. So Lover's uh, Call yeah. is a, sh yeah, maybe should I should tell a little about it? Sure. But... Yeah, absolutely. Please. Okay. So yeah, Lover's Call is a short. I mean, it featured about... my children. So That's I mean, right. talk all about Your as much as you daughters. like. <laughs> <laughs> that um, is a, a story about a man, a Muslim man, who is attracted to a woman who he assumes is also Muslim and turns out that she's not. She's practicing more traditional Yoruba, uh, Ifa faith. And they they have a moment, but then it you know it kind of is left um, open because he is hesitant to pursue this relationship, even though there is an attraction. And so yeah, just exploring the idea of interfaith relationships um, and assumptions that we make about one another based on our appearances. And and so that film is still streaming. It's on uh, Quayle TV. So yeah, you can you can watch that. Oh, right on, yeah, right, right on. We should mm. be supporting that platform anyway. So that's 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 yeah, that's right. Yeah, um, yeah. The 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 film that I saw of yours more recently was uh, not in my neighborhood. Yes, uh, yes. Which, I mean, I was blown away by that. Um, you know, so I definitely would want to talk with you about that because uh, uh, just off off. Uh, memory and some some you know scant notes here. It was it was it's it's international, it's pan African, mm -hmm. it's and yet it's all telling a very similar. It's anti colonial. It's but it's all telling this very similar story. Um, could you yeah just tell us about not in my neighborhood? Yeah, so um, not in my neighborhood. Um, that we released that in 2018. And um, it's still on the circuit. It's believe it or not, it's still on the festival circuit. We're still getting requests for um, film festivals and a lot of educational screenings. And just recently, it was acquired by Amazon Prime, so all your viewers and listeners can watch it on Amazon Prime if they would like. Um, but so, yeah, not in my neighborhood is a story about um, spatial violence, gentrification, displacement. Um, activism, you know, all these sort of things in these different locations of Cape Town, South Africa, Sao Paulo, Brazil, and, and New York, New York. Um, and so we really wanted to tell a grassroots story that puts you in the life of people who are actively fighting for a space in their city to remain there, fighting against displacement, fighting against gentrification, fighting against um, spatial violence in the form of police harassment, right? Um, all these different things. And so, yeah, that was about a, a five year journey. I'm, I was the co-producer on that project. My partner, Kurt um, Orderson, he directed it. He, so he's from South Africa. And we had a nice like global team. You know, we have producers in the US, in um, here in South Africa, in Brazil, and it, it, yeah, we are telling various stories, but we wanted to weave it in to show that this is a global issue um, and we can have, we can learn from one another. What are other people doing in other parts of the world to combat these different issues? Did you, uh, what, what, what are some of the similarities specifically that you could share? I mean, and, and especially, I mean, did anything, um, uh, I guess, I don't know, come up renewed after even this past summer. Mm, um, yeah, well, it, I it, think with this past summer, it's just like, it's the same thing, but just um, it's been blown up for more people to maybe acknowledge that 
um, this is happening, right? And so for us to make this film in 2018 and for there to be other films like this and other stories that ha they're like, it's the same thing over and over and over again. It's nothing new. We can, you know, we can go back beyond redlining, right? It's, it's, it's not something that's just happening recently. And, so, and that's another thing that we wanted to do is talk about the, the colonial aspect of um, what's happening in our communities and how we can trace it back to that. Like that is the, one of the original forms of spatial violence of someone coming in, um, taking over and like, you know, giving you a contract or, and, and now we're, we've got leases and apartments and, you know, public domain. It's just constant, like constant battle of um, control or uh, power, you know, and those who are disempowered. But, but, but similarly, and what we wanted to um, show in the film is this emphasis of people power. There really is people power. And so um, all of the characters that we follow are connected to organizations. They're not just like individual people who are trying to fight their landlord or trying to document the police or, you know, take, take um, someone to court. It's always um, a group of people. So in Brazil, it's the landless people's movements for, you know, and one, one, one example in, in Cape Town is to reclaim the city movement in New York, it's make the road. So um, yeah, a, a lot of the people maybe in the film wouldn't consider themselves activists but they really are because they're, they're organizing and mobilizing their community. And, but they're also being um, affected by it directly. They're not just a part of a nonprofit and trying to speak on behalf of people. And, and so that's one of the things that we really wanted to do and that what we did do in the film mainly is, is hear people who are directly affected, not so much the, the um, explanation, you know, the academic explanation or the analysis, or we didn't want to hear from the developers, we didn't, no. Who, who are the people directly impacted? What are they doing? How are they doing it? And what's the history of, of how this came to be? That's very emancipatory journalistic, that ethic. <laughs> That's exactly, I mean, seriously, the, the, to, to the, the, I mean, specifically, who are deemed the pundits and the experts mm. is a political uh, choice. It's an ideological choice. So I think it's, it's, it's great that you did that. I also think, by the way, personally, I'm, I'm, I also appreciated that I also always appreciate when Black America is included in global discussions of coloniality, because mm. I, I, I often think that that part of colonial experience gets left out, as if as if the the Black experience here is somehow something, although it has its particularities, it's not entirely distinct from that that process. So I don't I like I like that that that's included. Yeah, in that film. yeah. Um, I think that also adds to the idea that we've been brainwashed to to think that. American or like United States of America is white. Like that mm -hmm. is the origin, you know? And we often forget about indigenous people in the States. And we often, I think, forget that we are part of the Americas, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and we're attached to a, a larger history. So, yeah. We, one, one question that, that, that um, I have uh, sent in here is is given your travels and in, in the work in this film in particular, but I guess just your your travel in general. Do do black mm. people have a place anywhere outside of Africa? Outside of the, the African outside continent? of Africa, yeah, outside okay. of the continent of Africa, do black people have a place? Most definitely, because we're everywhere in the world. You know, um, I think that's another thing that we forget. It's like we are also in Latin America. We are also in Asia. We are also in Europe, um, and some some of those spaces we're we're there more more comfortably. We have a more recent history. Sometimes we have more of an ancient history that may be be swept under the rug. But I think that we have the right to make our place anywhere in the world that we want to. You know, we have that um, prerogative. Um, and when I'm traveling, I always feel like, no, I'm a melanated person. Like I have my people scattered around the world and I have the right to be out here, you know? Um, but at the same time, being very humble and not coming into like 
take over or dominate a space and say like, oh, I'm the black American or I'm the African American. And, you know, I know what's happening. Let me show y'all what's going on or whatever. Um, yeah. No, that's legit. I, absolutely. Um, you know, this comment came in and it made me think of a, of a question I wanted to ask you about anyway. Uh, um, this, this, how, how do you feel uh, if this is done with you like it is here? Uh, or just in general with this this dichotomy that's often developed by even people like me between the independent creators and the 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 industry work. So like even later today, you know, I, I you know I'm going to you know offer up a critique of the Fred Hampton. Well, it's not a Fred Hampton film. That's part of the problem. But 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 you know, is it? How do you feel as a, as a creator and someone familiar? At least you know, I think you know, uh, even independently, you're familiar with the industry and other artists and how, and, and what, what they have to deal with in, in the context. And I don't know, do you think it's fair to draw that dichotomy as, as sort of was done here? Between what and what? Sort of between the independent, like, like, so when Riverman is saying, you know, like, I'm going to go check out Najma's work while the rest mm. of y'all are out here watching these one night in oh. Miami's and American skins and black messiahs yeah. and all the, you know, the ball and chain is, is, is okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, you know, do, do, do you, I mean, on the one hand, I'm sure you appreciate people wanting to check out your work, but I mean, do you, do you appreciate that dichotomy? Do you have a different view of that, that distinction that people draw? Do you have any other thoughts on it that I don't, you know, I don't know. Well, I think like, yeah, that, dichotomy only exists because of money, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, and access and support. And so I, I'm the, I, I wanna watch everything, whether it's independent, you know, grassroots, YouTube premiere to something that's at, you know, TIFF or Sundance or something that's straight to theater, you know, theatrical release. Um, yeah, yes, I do feel like, especially I feel like when I was in film school, I was a lot more um, critical of the things I was watching. I was a lot more particular. Um, like, no, I'm only gonna watch certain films by like renowned filmmakers, or I'm only gonna watch independent films. I'm only gonna watch films by, um, you know, black filmmakers or people of color or, you know, and then something happened well, I feel like maybe I also kind of got caught up of like, okay, new release, what's out, blockbuster hit, let me check it out, <laughs> um, <laughs> you know? But I, I do like to see everything that's out there and whether I say, oh, this is trash or this is typical, this is following a Hollywood format, I also still want to ch check things out and see what's happening. But I feel that I have the um, the the knowledge, but I feel like a lot of people have this knowledge to watch things and decipher what's happening and break it down and not be tricked by it. You know, like just media in general is always like sending us signals and messages. Um, and so I, I love to watch something with that idea in mind and say, oh, look what they did there. Now, why did they make Brother Man say that? That's not right, you know? Um, and and just see it for what it is and keep it moving, you know. And then put put be intentional about my work and say, okay, I'm this is this is the work that I want to create in this particular way. Um, and I hope I can continue to do that even if I do get um, a project that is backed by a studio. You know, who knows? I know that could be very difficult, but I would but I would like to think I could kill, still keep that you know my own morals. So when I say to, to, to my students, I'm interested in, in if you if you have a, a thought or a criticism of this or you can expand on it, I'd love to hear it. If, if When I say to my students something like, because um, it sort of reflects reflective of what I even thought I heard you just say in that last answer. Uh, when I say to them, the, the person you see on camera is the least powerful person in the process of that product or producing mm. that product a lot of alliteration, mm -hmm. whatever. But uh, what do you think of, of a statement like that? Um, what, 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 as a filmmaker, and, 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 and what do you think of that? I think it depends. Like if it's an independent film, mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. um, like I'll just use our film, Not In My Neighborhood, for example. Yes, it's a documentary, so it's different than, you know, doing a narrative and having um, a script writer and a cast and, you know, some other producers maybe on board or whatever the, whatever the case may be. But um, our team, we are shaping the narrative arc. We are, you know, developing the treatment. We are selecting the people that we want to include in the film. Um, that it could be different if someone came to us and said, hey, we've got, um, you know, I don't know, 200K that we want to invest in this project, but these are some of like our stipulations and criteria. So it depends on who who's giving the money. And so I, I know that's probably why a lot of independent filmmakers like being indie filmmakers because they have more control, you know, um, more, more say in their work. And I'm sometimes shocked, even though I should know this, I'm still sometimes shocked when I hear other um, creatives or artists say like, you know, they have maybe have Academy Award and this and that and da, da 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 and premiered here and there and then they're still like I'm in the I'm in those meetings and I'm fighting for my story. Mm -hmm. I'm I'm constantly even if they're hired, they're the director and this person we see them we're like oh yes, this person is a wonderful person. They're like on this you know kind of celebrity type status, but it's still a battle even for them because of, like like you said of you know who is putting the money behind us, who, who greenlit this project. And so some people say like, we need to green light ourselves so you can uh, avoid some of that unnecessary drama and some of those limitations. Yeah, I was just thinking because as you as you were talking about thinking about how you watch a, a film and might ask yourself, why did, and I think you phrased it, why did they have so-and-so say that? That that's sort of mm. where I was thinking in terms of in, uh, in terms also because even even in the process you describe at the end of that is someone actually seen on camera and that person really isn't making many of the decisions at all um oh, they're either yeah. reading a script or they're giving an answer that you all are going to edit and put in a in a context that suits your film so that's that's just sort of the point i try to make just so to, for, for particularly for first year students in, in trying to start to think critically about what they're watching to just For think that sure. the person you're looking at really didn't have much to do in terms of the power structure with what they're involved. Yeah. In. Yeah. No, I think I was more so thinking of like intimate crew and then producers and executive producers, but yeah, no, sure. you're absolutely right. As far as like the, the, the characters, the actors on screen. Um, like I said, in a documentary, it, that's not scripted. They could have a little more agency in some kind of way, but for a narrative piece that is scripted, you know, they are auditioning and trying to get a job like everybody else. And, 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 and hopefully they're in a position where they can be selective and say, okay, this is the type of work I want to do, or they can give some notes on a script or something, you know, but that's not always the case. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, um, what I want to make sure I ask this, what, what are, uh, are there any, you know, cause we're already just sort of to the point you raised already, we have already, uh, we're constantly being encouraged to pay attention to a certain form of media product or a film or a premiere. Um, mm. are there any films, uh, um, obviously other than those you're involved with that you've, you've been watching that aren't getting the kind of attention that you think we should not to put you on the spot, but just something yeah. that yeah, <laughs> I'm like, oh you know, man, I'm, okay. and, and maybe you can come back to it. You know, there, there, we can we can we can come back to it. But but it, I did want to ask you about that. That um, uh, you know, because I see people, for instance, um, in the chat talking about the um, uh, you already mentioned Quelly TV and and mentioned and there's on canopy, the canopy yeah. here. Um, and you know, for a time at least, uh, Morgan State had had gotten us a full canopy pass, and now I, I think we've been reduced on that. And it had become mm. it, it opened up, and it, it's kind of messed with me. I even wrote an email in defense of the the, the policy, the, going back to the old policy, because I was like, you you opened up this treasure trove, treasure, of homes yes, that I've never heard of. I mean, from all over the world. And and then you're just gonna shut it back down to like a normal, like a little mini, you know, 
preview list, I was like, that's that's pretty trifling. That's messed up. It's like, yeah, <laughs> it's like, yeah. I'd rather yeah. have it never at all. Than whatever, whatever. But um, yeah. uh, but, but but anyway, but it, it's it's a reminder when you. It's almost. It's actually for me. It was overwhelming because there's so much in terms of of documentaries and and comedies and dramas and. I mean, the whole world, and there's so many people with so much talent producing so many interesting things that never get promoted, that never get yeah. heard. Um, yeah. And then um, even as we talk in some of my classes, struggle against the norm that's created by the norm. So it, it's, 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 in other words, people just have a negative reaction to something only because it doesn't look like what they're used to seeing. It has nothing to do with yeah. judging it on its own. Anyway, I'm, yeah, go ahead. I, I don't know. If, no, yeah. no, that's true. Um, I need to think about this more, but um, you know, a lot of films that I, I sometimes think the films that I'm watching, everybody else is watching too. Like, oh, I'm sure they heard about that or I'm sure they know, but that's sometimes not the case because I'm usually, you know, on these newsletters and I, I'm checking out what's happening at film festivals. And, uh, and unfortunately like the masses are not really into or aware sometimes or made aware of what's on the festival circuit. You know, you really need to like mm -hmm. have a theatrical re release or be on some type of um, popular uh, streaming platform. And then even then it's like, can they put the film on the home page of the streaming platform? Because that's just the default people see like, oh, this is a, it's new, let me check it out. Cause it's up there on blast for me. You know, sometimes it's hard to, to go digging and looking um, but, um, a film that I really enjoyed that is, you know, based in DC is called Residue by Morali Garima. It's on Netflix. Um, that film did really well on the festival circuit. The whole Garima clan is like my folks. So I just love that, you know, love that whole situation. But I think that people should check that out. And also, um, there's well, a film I, called used to see, I mean, you used to be in Sankofa Books. I mean, I mean, I, know. You there. I mean, that was your spot. <laughs> second I mean, home, yes. Yeah, I mean, it was like, yeah. yeah. Um, anyway, yeah. But um, there's another documentary called Time. Then, um, go I'm ahead. sorry, go ahead, yeah. No, I was going to no. say, no, go ahead, go ahead, Time. Go ahead, tell us about Time. <laughs> time by Garrett um, Bradley that's set in New Orleans. It's on Amazon Prime, and it's about um, a woman and how she dealt with uh, all of the the years that her husband was incarcerated and what that journey was like for her family. She documented it on um, home video footage. Um, and so those, those are popular films in the film festival or filmmaker world or indie circuit or whatever, but I, and getting a lot of love and attention, but they might not be I just think there's different worlds. There's like the indie world and there's a blockbuster Hollywood world. And sometimes they don't overlap necessarily. And I'm assuming that, that if, if the audience that, that the filmmaker is trying to target is, is black or brown and poor, they're not being mm. reached. Uh, you know, I mean, I've heard a lot of this in terms of the music business or music musicians more than I have with filmmakers, but musicians talk all the time about, yeah, you know, I'm trying to make this music for my black community, but I can't reach them. Mm. Um, and then historically, you know, in some cases they have more white fans, even if they're radically black. I mean, you know, I, I mean, I remember, you know, whether, you know, Dead Prez or even Bob Marley talked about that historically. Like I'm trying to talk to black people, but it's only these white kids in my audience. <laughs> like, mm. Anyway, uh, yeah, so I, I don't know if that's the same that. here. What it is like for an MC on stage and they look out in the sea of people and like you can't hardly see your folks. But Jimmy um, Hendrix once said, I'm not performing. He said he was like, I'm, I'm ready to quit. He was like, if you don't get black and brown people in my shows, I'm not performing anymore. Like at the end of his life, he was really frustrated by that. And mm -hmm. I know Marley said the same thing. Uh, and and um, I saw Dead Prez on stage <laughs> once at, at College Park, uh, basically shame the whole audience for being too white that that's my interpretation the experience at least uh mm -hmm. and they were struggling from the stage like saying like you know i'm you know you know we're happy to take your money but <laughs> we're not really talking to you um anyway so yeah, so yeah, sure. anyway yeah yeah no um i think that they we are getting 
we are through social media or other ways. I don't want to just say like oh, social media is so great and it's making the world wonderful and it's giving us access to one another. You know, I don't want to be that person. But I would say that there are um, ways in which we can, you know, interact with our communities and directly with the people that we want to see our work more than just solely having to rely on someone to endorse you or support you or sponsor you to put you on and be like, hey, y'all, y'all should listen to this film. Y'all should check out Nasha's film, you know? So, um, yeah, I think mm. we are starting to see more of ourselves in power, positions of power, and that can br um, bring up other people, support other people, and put other people on. Okay. Wow, what happened mm. in time? Because I said I wasn't going to watch any of these uh, yeah, I was gonna try to, uh, I don't know yeah, what happened in that joint. <laughs> like, um, oh my goodness. I, I think maybe it could be, it's not like, you know, anything violent or anything like that, like, like physically violent, but it could be emotionally violent. It could be triggering mm -hmm. just to have to um, see how so many black families are, are torn or are strained by mm -hmm. the, um, by incarceration and just that whole yeah. world but it is a beautiful film you know and the family does um i don't want to give it away but it, it, there is some sort of a a um a reunion you know okay well i said because i after i watched american skin i was like i can't i'm not doing this anymore like that was I my didn't, I didn't watch those movies. That yet. I didn't watch I, that yet. I won't spoil it, but I just can't take, I can't go through that. I can't, I can't be dragged through those emotions anymore in, in that mm. way. And, 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 you know, obviously, it, you know, obviously as a filmmaker, I'm sure you want to drag people through certain emotions at certain times, but those sets of emotions, I can't, I just can't keep, I can't, I can't do it anymore. Um, no, I hear hey, you. Just I that hear old you. cliche. I'm getting too old for this. I can't. But I'm like, I can't keep. I, I can't recover like I used to, man. I mean, it's like you know, wow, man. I mean, it's just too much. Um, well, it's and like parenthood. Films, it's mess. It's changed it for me too. So that's that's yeah, another, yeah. I'm that's sure. So, the thing anyway. is, films are magical, powerful, yeah. and amazing. Mm -hmm. So they can definitely have an effect on on people, and that is definitely the point. Um, but so everyone can decide for themselves what what they're comfortable watching or not, you know? So listen, we, I, I, I've, I've run through my list of questions. I want to, but as I always ask everybody, if, is, is there anything, a topic, a, a film, uh, anything that you want us to talk about or mention that, that I haven't brought up, uh, um, that I haven't, you know, led you through to in, in discussion? Um, I will just say before I forget, I, you know, I definitely, um, you know, want to, to, to do more, uh, you know, of these with you and, and as, as the work, you know, keeps coming out and um, particularly as, as uh, uh, you know, as classes get started back up too, want to have uh, yeah. students interact as well and hear from you as well. But anyway, but um, anyway, any, any, anything um, that I didn't yeah, lead you to that you wanted to, to, to cover? No, sure. I think um, because currently, since we we did bring up traveling and you mm -hmm. know someone said something about besides the African continent, but I wanted to talk about the being on the African continent since I am in South Africa, um, Cape Town at the moment. And oh, that's great. I didn't even I'm 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 thinking you right up the street in Baltimore for some reason. <laughs> I forgot no, you're yeah. in, I forgot that's where you are right now. <laughs> yes, yes. We're international. We're international, you know. Outer national. That's right. That's right. Um, so yeah, I'm just thinking about, um, you know, having more, um, or telling more Pan African stories, telling more stories that, as we did in not in my neighborhood, that are you know overlapping and international stories. I also want to continue in that tradition, of uh, if not being isolated in the U.S. or isolated amongst Black folks in the States. You know, I, I'm just all about connecting with Black people around the world, especially on the African continent. Um, I just think it's something that we we all in the, the diaspora need to have um, a, a pulse or a connection with, you know? 
Well, you know, I, I, first of all, are you there? Is this is are you filming something f uh, about South Africa? Is there is is this or or that's going to feature in something coming in the future? Yeah, or? yeah. So um, there were, I mean, like I said earlier, there's always like tons of projects in development. So there are a few projects that my partner and I are working on out here. Um, we're still. It, traveling and being here, you know, I realized that, yes, this is definitely a global p pandemic. So it's still very much a cautious space. And I, I, I don't want people to think that we're just like carelessly like traveling and trying to be out here like right, that. Right, right, um, right. You know, nothing like that at all. Um, but, but more so because my partner is from here and it was just a time for us to having to come back home this side and sort some things out. Okay, right but, right, right. but also, you know, but also like we're creatives, we're filmmakers, and we got we have projects out here at the same time. Um, so yeah, the one one project in particular that we're currently developing that is in the um, script writing phase is a story that is set between um, Cape Town and Mozambique, and it's based on a actual event of a shipwreck that happened in Cape Town um, in the 16th century um, called the San Jose. And so this, this ship, you may have be from, you might, you might be familiar with it because there are some remains of the ship that is at the Smithsonian. Say it sounds familiar, but, but yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, there's, I think in the, on the basement level at the African American Museum, uh, they have uh, like some pieces of the ship that they found in the ocean. And so I'm only like, um, I don't know, a 20 minute drive right now from this particular beach where this, the shipwreck occurred. And this area now presently is a very ritzy, glamorous, expensive space. Um, there's homes along the um, coast that are like multi-million dollar homes. A lot of the homes are owned by people from the US or Europe. Um, and it's a very exclusive space. But but I but anyway, that's just a backstory. But our story is more so about um, this ship that crashed coming from Brazil on its way to uh, coming from Mozambique on its way to Brazil, carrying enslaved people that crashed here in Cape Town. Um, half of the people drowned, half of them survived and were sold in, back into slavery here in Cape Town. Mm -hmm. So it's a story about set around that period of time. You know what? I've forgotten so many things, uh, uh, but of, of the many of, you know, of the many more recently was not only that you're in South Africa, but I had totally forgotten um, uh, that I didn't follow up with you after you put me in touch with your, the news, your newsmaker buddy oh, about yeah. the, the inauguration. Oh yeah. yeah I don't yeah, yeah, think, yeah. and frankly, I just don't think that that uh, they were ready know, for you. I don't, ready? <laughs> not, I don't think they were happy to hear because I remember the first part of the question. She was talking about how moved she was by the the inauguration, and I was. Oh, and, and, and they were the going that direction. Oh yeah. So as the question started building up, I remember thinking, "Uh oh," because I was like, she was talking about, you know, she was, and then she said, and then she, the pitch to me was, as an American. You, if I was as moved as I was in South Africa as an American, you must have been even more moved, or something to that effect. And I was just, I was like, mm. not quite moved in the way you think. Uh, so, but to her credit, because you know it, it has happened before, where mm -hmm. I'll get the first question and then that's it, and then the 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 interview ends, and then they uh, they you uh. know it's just, it, it's just real quick. To her credit, yeah. I mean, she was a professional. I couldn't see her, but I could mm -hmm. hear her. And she was a professional. She bounced back and she gave, I think she was like two more follow-up questions. Uh, and so she okay. suffered through my responses, you know, professionally. Um, but yeah, but anyway, it was, I, I had forgotten that to follow up with you about that because it was kind of funny. Uh, but yeah, see, ahead, but. This, is, this is why I'm even saying earlier why I think it's so um, critical that we in the diaspora have a connection, you know, um, to the continent still, because 
we need to keep these lines of communication open so they know how the people are feeling in the states and we how we know how the the people the real people are feeling here because it it, it can easily become just this surface thing of um the idea that you know stereotypes oh the idea that everybody here is suffering and and all those stereotypes and the idea that everybody mm -hmm. over there is living a good life mm -hmm. um you know, so there, there is so much misinformation between our worlds that um, my first time coming to Cape Town, I mean, Cape Town is a whole nother segment, right, a whole nother right, story. Right, There's right, so right, much right. here politically, racially, socially, historically, um, that it could, be, it could be a lot to experience um, for someone coming from the diaspora. But critical, but but there's a lot of um, information and history to digest. And I'm the type of person when I travel, I'm not, I mean, this is also kind of partly my, my second home now, but when I go into a space, I'm not there just to have a good time. Right. I'm not there just to go to the tourist destinations. I'm also there to like go to the library, go to the archives, go to the townships, talk to people, like be a part of the community. And, and so I feel also that our world with social media, we've gotten into this whole thing of, um, yes, black people travel, do your thing and like go there in a gown and pose on a mountain. It, no, like do that, but there has to be more to the experience. I feel, I feel, you know? Absolutely. Um, I know that's- I'm, not, first, I'm sorry. Yeah, go ahead, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. I'm sorry, go ahead. No, 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 go ahead, Finn. No, I was going to say, and lastly, I was going to say, I know that's a great ploy to just get Black people um, in regards to like a consumer marketing level um, excited about traveling, getting our, because, you know, we also have that stigma of like we don't want to go anywhere like outside the Caribbean or something like that, right? So I know like that is a tool to inspire us to, to travel, to go out and like, hey, it's safe, it's fun, and it's beautiful, but... There has to be more and and not more in the sense that I'm going on a township tour. Right. Right. No. You know, yeah. so um I'm very glad that you said that because you know, I, I think starting with my own classrooms, but but just in general the, with with a lot of uh, anti-pan-africanist uh uh logic being thrown around lately that that um mm. that and and I often hear, you know, people uh, uh black Americans will say something um well of black Americans trying to defend the anti pan African ethic will say something or use an experience to say something or usually refer to someone else's experience by saying, you know, they went to the continent and, you know, uh, they were treated just like any other foreigner and treated just like any of the, you know, this and that. And, and then, but I would ask, well, how, how did you engage the community when you got there? You know, mm -hmm. in other words, if you get there and you say, you know, you get in the cab and you're like, well, where's the mall and where's the this and where's the, then they're going to treat you like that. I mean, that's exactly mm -hmm. then, then, of course, as anybody would treat you, they're going to say, OK, they're here to get the I'm going to give them that. Um, yeah, uh, you have to you know, I've, I mean, I've. Look, even I you know, looking the way I look have been throughout the continent and not to romanticize, but if you go and approach people as if you are a part of the diaspora often enough you'll be you'll you'll get that level of experience back uh um more or less you know at least but if you go yeah. as to say look i'm trying to get my you know my my get my groove back or whatever you know and 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 all of that then of course it's going to be a very i don't know i think you know empty empty experience uh, by the way i do want it, it, and I would love your help in this, but I do want to encourage more of this conversation. So if there are any um, uh, folks that you know down there that want to 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 uh, have Pan-African conversations uh, that I can help facilitate, we're always trying to do that. Mm, um, okay. uh, even in particular, because even just this morning I was talking uh, with a friend of mine, we were, you know, this this issue came up again about. Uh, again, related to the to the, the to the Judas uh, and the Black Messiah film, but but this question of well, you have a continental African playing Fred Hampton, and this is in some sense some spaces caused controversy, mm. uh, where some Black Americans are saying, well, how are you going to have that happen, and this, that, and the third, and then I, you know, politely even in my classrooms, and I've even tried to play, well, you know, we've had 
you know, not uh, not all the people on the continent, particularly a lot of continental African actors, were not thrilled when Jill Scott played Winnie Mandela, mm. or Denzel played Steve Biko, or Forrest yeah. Whitaker played Idi Amin. Um, you know, so uh, you know. Uh, anyway, I, I, no. Only thing I'll say on that is, I feel like that is just low hanging fruit. You know, mm. we have to go beyond that type of petty easy, basic conversation or, or want to be riff, you know, it was like, come, we, I, I feel that we have um, other things to concern ourselves with. Like that, is, that is another divide and conquer. We can't continuously like fall for this trick. It, it's really not that deep. And I always feel also that, well, then let's make another film. There can be 10 films on Fred Hampton. There's like, there's there's 20 or 10 on Martin Luther King, you know, like w the, the more to the canon, the better, the more pieces of, of information, the better. And I'm not saying like, I don't, um, I'm, I'm not saying that let's just make any and everything and the content doesn't matter. The content in the film doesn't matter. But I, I, um, I think that the more Someone said recently, like the idea of the more, the better, because we are, as we know, we have a limited supply of things that we feel are ours, like movies made by us, for us, with our people in them. So therefore we are definitely very critical because we've only got like a handful, but if we had a, pl a, pl a plethora of films, then we wouldn't nitpick of the idea of someone from outside of this, you know, political, geopolitical space playing this particular character. No, I agree. But the, the only problem is that we, we, we can't have a plethora of, of institutionally, commercially supported and funded films. That's the problem. Like, we're not yeah. going to get, we're, we're not going to get, you know, um, uh, you know, I don't know, 20 films on Fred Hampton funded to the tune, even this one was funded. Um, we're, definitely. Not gonna get, definitely. we're not going to get a Disney. Definitely. Disney's not going to make a, a hundred million dollar Black Panther party film. <laughs> <laughs> not, but, at but I hear you. not at all. But I hear you. And that's one reason why I was happy to wanted to, to connect and have this conversation, because I think it is important even to 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 to. And I want to do more of introducing people, particularly my own students, to filmmakers who are able to have careers and make great films uh, even outside of these studio structures uh, that yeah. can create ultimately the plethora we're talking about, uh, even if it's outside of, of, of some of these uh, commercial spaces. So uh, uh, anyway, I, I, I you know greatly appreciate that and uh, this entire conversation and certainly all of your work. And I look forward to building more and checking more of it out. Um, and again, let me uh, uh, again ask you for any any final words or thoughts. Uh, I'll, I'll give them to you. But um, uh, uh, anyway, I look forward to the next time. And thank you very much for, for joining me and us. Yeah, yeah, no, this was great. This was so much fun. It feels so. Um, I mean, you're you're. I know you. I've known you for a while. So it's a nice, uh, relaxed, great vibe conversation. So I appreciate you yeah. having me on. Um, and. Lastly, I'll say in regards to like having a career as a filmmaker, just for like maybe if your students are watching or going to listen later, is that um, everyone finds their path differently. And so I feel that a lot of filmmakers are specifically independent filmmakers. There's a lot of multitasking happening. You know, a lot of us like mm. myself are also, you know, instructors in um, universities or doing adjunct or, you know, just like various projects, funding something, getting funding and then writing a grant for the next project. Like that is just the reality sometimes. So um, yeah, I think we're all, um, we, we're all looking to be uh, supported, you know, um, encouraged and just, give not i don't want to say we need to get to be given anything but of course if you want to create something you need time and space to do that and that that equals money so mm. there is a lot of <laughs> mm. 
Mm. There's a lot of, I don't want to say hustling, but there's kind of is a lot of hustling that you have to do a lot of multitasking at the same time, trying to like take care of yourself and take a nap, you know? So. Hey, I know that's right. <laughs> I know that's right. Um, Hey, no. And, oh man, this, I, yeah, we, and, and I definitely, look, I have to also take advantage of the fact that I know you and that you're down there and connect with a couple uh, uh, else that I've, I've come across from down there because, uh, again, selfishly, Trevor Noah is taking up too much space in my consciousness and we got to expand the South African range of, <laughs> of cats from down there. Like, he can't become this singular representative of South Africa in the Black community in the United States, which, which sometimes it feels to me is becoming the case and, and I have an issue with that. So, selfishly, Anyway. Yeah, yeah, no, that's just unfortunate because when we find a name when it's brought to us in the West, then that's like the only one we know, you know, and that just sticks. But yeah, there's there's a lot of people here doing amazing things and amazing work. We would expect that would be the case. So yeah, well, Najma Nuruddin, thank you very much. I really appreciate the reconnection and and you joining thank me here for this conversation. I can't wait to do it again. Uh, uh, good luck with everything. Travel safe, all of that good stuff. Peace to the struggle down there in South Africa as well. And a zania, some some might want to call it still. You know. What I'm yes, saying? yes, yeah. most definitely. <laughs> thank you all so right. much, Jared. It's great. You much. Anytime, anytime. Peace, peace. All right. All right, everybody, thank you very much for joining us this morning for this edition. Please, if you can, come back in about 90 minutes uh, where I'm going to give my first run thoughts on the uh, film nominally described by some as a biopic about Fred Hampton. Uh, and uh, we'll discuss that and uh, as a first run of many other conversations to come. So again, thanks everybody for the lively chat and, and, and conversation and engagement. Again, shout out to Najma for coming through. Uh, and as always, as Fred Hampton used to say to you, we say peace if you're willing to fight for it. So peace. We'll see you next time in about 90 minutes at I Mix What I Like Live. I mix what I like, what I like, what I like, what I like, what I like. I mix what I like, what I like, what I like, what I like, what I like.